and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where Hollywood, I would describe Hollywood as ticking along, avoiding crises for now. Like, IATSE has reached a deal, tentatively, which means no strike tomorrow, but union members still have to vote on it, and a lot of peeps ain't happy. Uh, IATSE said, oh, look at all the great stuff we got, but unfortunately for them, a lot of union members were able to find the stuff that they did not get. Uh, so we're not out of the woods there just yet, but it's, you know, we've averted a strike for now, I guess is the way to say it. And then as for the box office, it ain't horrible, but it ain't great either. Halloween Kills nabbed the top spot easily, but that's still almost 30 million less than the debut of the last movie three years ago. Yeah, it's a pandemic. But Venom 2 managed to outperform its last entry. Is the pandemic still a valid excuse for low box office numbers, opening weekend and totals? You know, I don't think it is anymore. I mean, I think, well, in a way that it is. So I think that in terms of fear of going to the theater, I don't think that's a thing anymore. I think that for the most part, people feel comfortable and you know, you can decide whether or not for you, you feel like you should be wearing a mask, but you have that option. There are lots of times during the week for you to go and people are going. But the pandemic, this is where it gets tricky. The pandemic has trained people to watch content via streaming, subscription video on demand and premium video on demand. It's cheaper, it's more convenient, and in many ways, it's an overall more pleasant experience. Oh, that's a big one. There is so much quality content available on streaming, eight hour, eight, eight plus hour movies that you can watch. And, and that's just new stuff. Forget digging in. Like I'm working my way through the Sopranos. Thanks everybody again. I'm having such a good time. It is an amazing show. And it's just, you know, it's, it's really strong quality content. And viewers, as for new content, if it's a movie, a theatrical release, well, they can just wait the 45 days, and in some cases less, for it to show up on digital. That's Hollywood's new problem of their own making. And they're both players. The studios are both things now. They're both the movie studio and, in many cases, the streaming studio. So it's, it's lopsided. I mean, and then, of course, it's a problem as to who's getting a cut of that, but as far as the studios go, they're still getting most of that money. Now, quality is key also. On the smaller screen, it's worth noting that writers are in the driver's seat. But on the big screen, writers don't get no respect. That's been a problem for a very long time in Hollywood. Uh, and that's something I think that the studios used to be able to get away with when it came to movies. But now... I think that's something that they should think about. I think maybe perhaps writers should be taken more seriously with big screen movies if they want to be able to compete with the quality of streaming content. Also, another advantage that the movies used to have was they were spectacle, shock and awe. They had huge budgets. But now TV streaming services can afford the same level of budget, so it's just as good, just as grand, but if there's more of it, and in some time, in many cases, it's, it's better written. And I think people also like the longer movies, because they get more, you know, it's, you know, how many of you spent all weekend uh, binging you, right? Or in a day binging you season three. It's really fascinating uh, how the preferences have changed. And people haven't become shut-ins. There's lots of stuff to do outside. You could take your phone or tablet outside. Also, in terms of a big screen, televisions have gotten huge and sound systems have gotten quite advanced. More and more people have very big, you know, setups and in some cases, their own screening rooms. So very interesting. As movie theaters get smaller, for instance, the Alamo Draft House is opening this week in downtown uh, Manhattan, and they don't have a single really big screen. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, Halloween Kills uh, has even lower audience scores than the last entry. That's why I brought up quality. Uh, I thought it was fine, but I mean, everyone I know who's going to watch Halloween Kills is going to watch it on streaming. And on that note. It's nice that offering it day and date on Peacock didn't hurt its opening weekend, but that's really just a glaring example of how few people are willing to pay for Peacock's premium service, which is the only way to get the movie. It's not available on the ad version of the streaming service. Just like HBO Max has two tiers, and you don't get the first-run movies if you, if you get the cheaper ad-supported version. Now, speaking of HBO Max, it is worth noting that Halloween Kills doubled the Suicide Squad's opening, both day and date, both rated R, 
both on a struggling street on struggling streaming services, you know, not doing as well as the top three, Netflix, Disney Plus and Amazon. But since HBO Max, oh, and by the way, Halloween Kills actually has pretty much matched the total glo- uh, domestic haul of the Suicide Squad in a single weekend. That's not good. That doesn't look good. That's not a good look. And I continue to feel that James Gunn's DC content has a strong, to be fair, strong but limited audience. Take DC Fandom, where once again, history repeated itself and Gunn's trailers did not perform at the par of the other big brand talent, the uh, uh, big brand uh, trailers that came out. Uh, I mean, there were very few trailers this year, but if you compare the Batman to Peacemaker, they ain't even close. And Peacemaker's connected to the movies, by the way. And for comparison, the Hawkeye trailer is in the same league as the Eternals trailer. The Eternals trailer did a little better, but that's, I think, more, that's, again, as I said, at least they're in the same ballpark. But Disney stumbled a bit too this weekend. It wasn't all rosy in the Magic Kingdom, as their theaters only plan didn't do anything for The Last Duel, which opened in fifth place with just under five million. Audiences and critics didn't care for much for the film, you know, either one of them. And Ridley Scott once again gets hammered for making a movie about a region of the world, yet doing nothing to accurately represent that region. He hasn't made the same mistake for House of Gucci. It's a little cartoonish, but at least it seems regionally appropriate. I think the last movie he got away with that on was Gladiator, and I thought it was very striking when I recently rewatched the film. It's an amazing movie, but you know, it's a global market. You, you know, the old, everybody has a British accent thing. I'm like, Caesar has a British accent? What the heck, what the heck is this? Uh, Russell Crowe did a phenomenal job in that movie and carries it extensively. But anyway, with a strong global market these days, thanks to technology, people really want authenticity. I mean, the number one show that Netflix has ever had is in Korean. I think that's very telling. No Time to Die managed to have a better second weekend hold than most other recent blockbusters, falling just 56% instead of the usual near 70. But with Dune and Eternals coming, it's likely to be one of Daniel Craig's worst performing bonds domestically. Globally, the film is faring a little better, and I suspect it will do very well on digital. When are you going to watch Bond? If at all. You can say you're not going to watch it, but I know a lot of people who are waiting to stream it. Uh, Because again, the theater experience, I feel you have to, I think the theater experience is so difficult with people on their phones and stuff and it not being clean. And I think, yeah, I guess safety to a degree uh, in many ways. Uh, So I think people are like, I really like watching my content at home. That's like, that's what Hollywood has to combat. Uh, Speaking of digital, I hear many, I hear from many of you that a 4K copy of Dune has leaked online. Uh Uh-oh, where did it come from? Uh, we'll see what, because it's not on HBO Max yet, and we'll see what effect that has on the movie's opening weekend this Friday. Its overseas numbers have stalled for now. Venom is also doing okay, but with just 283.7 worldwide, no way it's going to be able to get anywhere near the first movie's total by the time Eternals lands. The MCU giveth and the MCU taketh away. Let's head over to streaming. Uh, We'll start with Nielsen, as usual, for the week of September 13th. No big changes from last week, with Hulu still the surprising heavy hitter of the Disney bundle right now. Who would have thought they'd ever be MVP? Uh, You guys were right. Hulu's a great service. I love Hulu. Uh, Well, what if just cannot break out of the bottom of the top 10? That's nuts. Uh, As for movies, I'm thrilled to see Kate hold on to the number one spot. Loved that movie. Such a wonderful surprise. Uh, Well, the clock struck midnight uh, for Amazon's Cinderella, which fell to eighth place. At least it's still in the top 10. But for the last two weeks, it was uh, number two. This is his third week. Sam Raimi's Nightbooks, which he produced, did okay. On Netflix this week, Netflix was right to renew you for season four right before it debuted as it unseated Squid Game for the top spot. We wondered how long Squid Game would be number one just last week, and it it fell out. That's crazy. Um, And you, by the way, trended all weekend on Twitter. Very, very strong brand. Uh, But Squid Game, still number two. Squid Games ain't going nowhere. Just slipped down a little bit. And Made is still right behind it as well. And it looks like Netflix's U.S. subscribers are hungry for even more Korean content as new series My Name also managed to debut in the top 10. That's incredible. How long until movies and other streaming services realize that there's something here? And can they capture the same magic? Can they do it right? That's incredible. Also, uh, Dave Chappelle's The Closer is still doing well on the service. As this week, we learned that he got paid $24.1 million for that comedy special alone. 
just for that special. That's incredible. And got paid around $20 million for his last comedy special as well. How do we know that? Because an angry Netflix employee leaked that information and other confidential stuff to Bloomberg this past week and was fired for that transgression. Uh, some other Netflix employees were suspended for um, some of their activities, all stemming from the Dave Chappelle blowout, but they were reinstated because it felt that they, uh, they, were, they still were uh, in the bounds of professionalism. This is a tough one. I, I think that Dave Chappelle went too far. I think he went too far. Uh, I think Hannah Gadsby, of course, also on Netflix, had some of the best uh, counter arguments to date. They were very strong, very well made, yet uh, remained professional. I think that um, she handled it incredibly well. Uh, and on iTunes, Free Guy, still number one. Couldn't have happened to a better movie, totally deserves it. We knew it would do gangbusters on, that, uh, on uh, streaming as well as in theaters. While Old Henry and Adam's Family 2 are also continuing to do very well. Old, not so much. Just recently finally hit the service, not making much of a splash. While Black Widow and F9 have surged yet again, now that they've hit a new price point, or dropped to a new price point, I think is the better way to put it, as you can now rent them for just $6. And doing homework continues to be a big driver on iTunes these days. Ah, this is excellent. This is a new uh, source of revenue for them to push this, with viewers watching the last installments of both Halloween and Bond. They should play that up big time. That's very interesting. Uh, as for this coming week, Dune will hit theaters uh, and HBO Max. I'm curious to see how social media will react to the film. That's another thing. Uh, now that you can watch these movies at home with your, with your phone, uh, you, know, you know, you can really talk about them and they, they, tre they get, uh, well, they get discussed and in some cases ripped apart a lot more uh, quickly. But it is fun to see, uh, to have that discussion. I think it makes it a little bit more of a party. So it's got uh, good and bad elements to it. Uh, but I'm curious to see how people react to Dune. It's stunning. It has social media favorites, Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya. But again, it has that strong white savior vibe. I know that many of you say that Dune eventually is a commentary on that, but it's not at all clear from the first movie that that's the case. So I think some of you who are Dune defenders are going to be very busy on social media this weekend uh, trying to make sure everybody understands that. I think that um, it maybe would have been better to, for Warner Brothers and Denis Villeneuve to do more to get out ahead of that. I know that some of you have said Villeneuve has addressed that in some of his interviews, but I don't think that they are, I don't think they've queued it up well enough. And Disney will try again with their theaters only strategy with another two Fox leftovers. Uh, and French Dispatch, by the way, is limited release this weekend before going wide the weekend after. On streaming, Succession Season 3 debuts on HBO tonight and HBO Max. It should be pretty buzzy. You know, everybody loves Succession, but it still has not become, to date, it's still not the level of other shows. So let's see if it can do it with its uh, third season. I'm excited. I'm, I'm definitely tuning in. The Injustice animated movie, which some of you have told me has also leaked, is available for digital purchase on Tuesday. And on Friday, Apple TV debuts Invasion with Sam Neill, uh, on their service. Well, Netflix, yep, Netflix has yet another busy week. There's new movies stuck together, Night Teeth and Maya and the Three, along with new adult animated series Inside Job, and Gwyneth Paltrow will see if she can turn her brand Goop into a TV show. That's going to be interesting. I think she just wants to trend. I don't think she cares if it's good or bad. She just wants to trend. So let's see if she does. So what have you been watching and what do you plan to watch? And how, if Dune is opening new, new for you this Friday, how will you watch it? Will you watch it on, uh, in theaters? Will you watch it on HBO Max? Or have you already watched it? Uh, and how do you think Hollywood can get viewers back into theaters more consistently again? Share those thoughts down below, subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.